This week on the agenda, I'm at the World Economic Forum in Davos to find out how the world's manufacturers are navigating the path to net zero. The manufacturing sector accounts for one-fifth of global carbon emissions and uses about half the world's energy. And even though going green is the buzz of the boardroom, only one in two companies are on track to meet their targets. So what's holding manufacturers back? And how can tech innovation help them on the path to net zero? I spoke to Gwenael avis Executive Vice President at Schneider Electric, Holger Klein, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of ZF Group, Martin Lundstedt, President and Chief Executive Officer of Volvo, and Bran Cheng, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Foxconn. If we look at the manufacturing segment and its a supply chain, actually it represents about 30% of greenhouse carbon emissions. Yeah. So it's a lot of challenges, especially for SME, because the data transparency that might involve with uh, cost, might involve with uh, technology challenges, a lot of barriers. So I think uh, the, the collaboration will become very important. A couple of points you should raise up. One is uh, the, the policy and regulation, yeah. which means in each region maybe requires some standard and incentive, also the regulation for you to follow up. Second thing is uh, like a financial and investment. So it's still very challenging, as I mentioned, the cost always a concern in a business, right? So I think in a, in a manufacturing segment, we probably need more uh, financial institutes to invest and also have uh, some uh, 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 financial support to let them do the digitalization to make the data transparency. <clears throat> Well, we were talking before, Martin, and Holger was saying that you, you are leading the industry in the way you're bringing all your suppliers with you. How, how, how would you say that the big picture is for manufacturing on that path to net zero? No, but I think we have, of course, been working with these uh, topics for uh, a long period of time, uh, not at least when it comes to scope one and scope two. Uh, just to give one data point, I mean, our biggest operation in Europe, uh, that is our Gantt operation for truck assembly in, in Belgium, became fossil free net zero in 2008. Uh, so, so the scope one and scope two journey, and also when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, buying energy, etc., has been ongoing for a long period of time. We know how to do it uh, and, and its execution, if I put it like that. Yeah. Uh, the big thing that is happening now is the discussion around scope three. <coughs> <laughs> and that is really positive for everyone in the value chain. Right. Because what is happening is that if you take Volvo as an example, 2040, we should deliver everything fossil free, which is a huge undertaking. It means that we need to have material change 25, 2030, uh, given the fact that we are a 55 billion com uh, company in 190 countries. And that means that drive of the scope three that represents almost 90 plus percent of our emissions is just a joint effort. And what we are doing now, both downstream and not at least upstream then when it comes to the manufacturing that represent maybe 70% of our added value, is to actually partner up with our key uh, partners when it comes to the tier one structure because they can also lead the way to supporting us for, for their partners and their partners upstream. And this is a big shift also when it comes to the, uh, the, the traditional relation between uh, people in, in the value chain that has been rather transactional, moving to a much more of a partnership structure. So it's not enough just to say, right, this is Volvo's goal for 2024. No. You need to we talk can never to everybody. It. Oh, we, you need everyone to <laughs> be on the same page and to be able to take those steps as well. So, um, Gwen Ayer, you know, let's talk about those shifts that are needed for, for net zero to be that engine for sustainability, but also that engine for growth. What's the outlook at, at Schneider Electric? Well, thank you very much. I think you, you have the right question because in the industrial sector, first we think about quality, we think about cost, we think about productivity, we think about you know, delivery on time, and we question about sustainability. Right. And what we have to showcase is that it's hand in hand. Absolutely. In reality, sustainability is bringing productivity. And just to give you one example, within Schneider Electric, we started a journey on sustainability 20 years back. We have grown the business by four times. So it's just good for business. 
yes, it's good for business. Is it easy? No, it's not easy because it's a culture shift. You have to embark, you know, the manufacturing, the industrial uh, setup so that people are truly committed. And that's the big shift that we have to make. First, it's not really technology because technology exists. It's scaling the technology. But before that, it's really making sustainability as a priority and making sure that we walk the talk in everything what we do in an organization. And the second element, uh, rebounding on what you were saying earlier, is that it's not only us. It's every partner's customers, suppliers, how to embark them. Right. Just to give you one example, when we started the journey on sustainability, we wanted to embark our suppliers. So we said, let's take our 1,000 suppliers, trying to reduce their emission by 50% in 2025. Was that a condition of doing business with them? Yes, it was yes. a condition, but we didn't know how to achieve <coughs> that. And I think it's good, because in sustainability, if you reach or if you determine a target that you know how to reach, you will not reinvent. And the way we're thinking about sustainability, rethinking our business model, rethinking the way we address manufacturing, rethinking the way we approach suppliers. So we didn't know how to reach this target. But finally, it took like two years for us to reach out to the suppliers, to embark them in the journey, to, to do training, because they didn't know how to calculate carbon footprint, etc., and to bring them into that direction. It's just to show that at the end of the day, it's culture beyond technology that is already existing, scaling, and it's embarking suppliers and customers in this journey. So in terms of that, that um, culture beyond the technology, Holger, I mean, who, who is setting the tone? You know, what best practice solutions from the private and public sector are helping make the progress to achieve that industry net zero? Yeah, for example, we as an automotive supplier to customers like Volvo, etc., we committed on, on buying 10% of our global steel volume now as green steel. Yeah, and what was something which was created here in Davos, and all of us now went out there and asked for green steel, and that creates then the capacity in the market because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Yeah, there needs to be always a business logic behind it. For me, the interesting building out what Martin said is now what do we master and where do we see our challenges? And I would say for us as a company, we by 2040 will be climate neutral. In 2030, we will have reduced our uh, emissions in scope one and two, everything we can influence by 80%. And for scope three, only 40%. Yeah? And you ask why only 40%? Because we need to bring the value chain along. But the proof point is now not 2040. We need to measure it really exactly. year by year. Exactly. And if I look at those numbers, hey, it's only six years from now yeah. where I need to come back here and tell you it worked. Yeah? And this is where we are all in it together. And I feel the momentum. Regulation-wise, we see a huge uh, diversity. Yeah? Where in China, for example, it's technology open. Do whatever it takes to bring the carbon footprint down. In Europe, we have a lot more regulation. And some of that is very, very complicated and perhaps even misleading. <coughs> yeah, so perhaps we need to become less complex in that. So I want well. to talk more about that, what, what's holding everyone back. Because you're talking and you're all chiming in with each other about how it's important for companies to talk to each other all along the supply chain. But Martin, <laughs> what, what about what governments are doing? What, what policy measures are actively supporting this transition? And what could do better? Who could do better? And what I think is a big ask is to continue to, I mean, push regulation in the direction where we want to go, but also decomplex when it doesn't make sense anymore, because we have a tendency to add and not to do the cleaning. Right. And I mean, it's like a corporation. We know that from time to time you need to prune the portfolio in terms of product lines, businesses, geography, what could be whatever. We need to prune the regulatory portfolio because otherwise we will not see the forest for all the trees. And the forest here is a net zero journey that is absolutely necessary. And then we need to make sure that we are concentrating on that. So that is number one. Number two, if I take the complete deployment now of... Uh, because scope three, what is beautiful about that is everyone will come to logistics. You know, everyone has to address logistics, 
and it could be 6% of your top line or your emissions, it could be 20%, it could be 40%, it doesn't matter, everyone has to do that. The interesting piece about that is that you think about, yes, I have a truck here, electric, or hydrogen, uh, power, uh, fuel cell powered electric, or whatever, that is fossil free, that is the equipment. But that needs to be times, and I de deliberately say times, infrastructure, times green capacity, times green energy, mm. times reasonable Just TSO, in terms of carbon pricing, for example. Because, and it's times and not plus. Because if any one of those are zero, mm -hmm. it is zero. That is mathematical, uh, proved that it's times, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that we need to think about. Yeah. And Europe in particular has not had an intentful view on their balance sheet in terms of energy systems, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of digital built out, in terms of a lot of different things. When we look at countries and regions like China, Korea, Singapore, it's a completely, and many more, it's a completely different view on how does the balance sheet look like in order to host this? We need to come back to that discussion. But the political system, for many different reasons that we cannot take today, has not been able to do that because, I mean, we, someone said wisely yesterday, uh, uh, we know what is right to do, but we don't know how to be re-elected when we do it. <laughs> and, and I think that is a very good way of putting it. And they also need um, quite a lot of funding to be able to do that. So I wonder if something that could help is maybe new technology. So, so let's talk about that, Grenayel. So the emerging technologies that, that are really demonstrating that promising potential to help us on this journey. Yes, well, um, in terms of technology, I think that everybody in this forum are talking today about AI, generative AI, etc. And uh, we may think about some applications, but this is also applicable for net zero industry, for the manufacturing. And we have to realize that there are plenty of application. Most of the time, it starts with the hardware, but then with the hardware, we connect the hardware, and with AI, we have plenty of use cases. And that's the power of it, that's the beauty of it, because each use case is developed you know, on, on a regular basis, so we improve you know, the, the production plant, we have more IoT embedded, etc. and that's how we develop the Industry 4.0. And everything is based first on hardware, but then it's software, it's AI. And this is where we will see more and more development, more connected products, more efficiency, more applications. Brian Tony, do you agree? Is this, um, is this how AI is going to set the agenda? Well, yeah, I, I guess something to share with you. For AI, it's so attractive and exciting recently, right? So actually, facing the beauty of AI, also when you look back, what's the impact? You know, actually, when you run an AI server to come out of computing power, it can shoot tons of power than before. We used to use air cooling, right? But air cooling cannot sustain for like a, every GPU come with more than 400 watt, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you had, you had tons of GPU together. So you are gonna offer an entire city electricity power to support it. Computing power, are you gonna do that? No. So technology works. So now we come up with a new material, as an example in the, as example in the semiconductor segment, the silicon carbide the third generation of uh, yeah. new material, yeah. which have a better thermal consumption, better thermal dissipation, lower power consumption, to lower down the power consumption. Second thing is they use different approach for cooling, this, which is uh, going to be liquid cooling system. You know, in addition, uh, what famous is uh, immersion cooling. The so liquid cooling probably is going to be more popular. So which reduce, so we talk about how to approach this. One is reduce. Reduce is reduce all this kind of power consumption. But more important is to resolve, as I mentioned, new technologies. You use new material, you use new approach of technologies. Then you can make sure the beauty of AI. Otherwise, AI uses more power. Who is going to offer that power? Mm. So as a closure system, you do not only think about the beauty. Also, you need some solution to balance, to it. balance, balance it. it all and you can realize, but very important, the framework. As we mentioned that, either government or enterprise, like when we're in China, the government has a very supportive chance to support us to set up the standard. Like we, we, we already passed, hit the, the carbon peak in 2022, and we're going to finish the new, new 
uh, 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 energy, you know, you know, you know about energy by 2035, and you're going to reach net zero on 2050. So all this requires lots of collaboration with industries, mm -hmm. with <laughs> governments. So we set a standard. And let me build right on yeah. this. Yeah, you know, I think two examples from our industry. Yeah, you know, first of all, you design the carbon footprint into the product. What does that mean? If you don't start with a product design, yeah, you will unwillingly increase the carbon footprint. I give you an example. We now presented a magnet-free electric engine. What does that mean? Yeah? If you look at the production and the value chain of magnets, that accounts for 50% of the carbon footprint for an electric engine. If you just replace that yeah, by an inductive uh, uh, technology, <laughs> then you can do without. So it starts with our designers, and their innovation makes, uh, makes really major steps to solve the problem. And then I go to the other side of the cycle, remanufacturing. And I think for us, circularity becomes more and more important, and it's a super business. We'll pause there, but stay with us as still to come here on the agenda from Davos. More from my panel on why it makes more business sense for industrial companies to partner up right the way through the supply chain. We are all connected. Across borders. Across continents. Connected by ideas a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda from the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos. Let's hear more on how manufacturers are collaborating on going green. It's one thing having all of this new technology that's going to increase sustainability, but what about growing your business too? So growing the business is of course on the side where we design the new products, but the aftermarket and the remanufacturing is a growth area for us, because right. otherwise we don't solve our, our um, problems in the value chain. Yeah. Talking about growth, this is growth, because otherwise it should just have been scrapped. Now it's coming into the cycle again. Uh, so so uh, that is a business case that is very positive. And if you think about it, with, with, uh, if we can dream for a little bit to say, okay, we, we will have a, a more global price of CO2, we'll make that model even more attractive. It's already attractive uh, because more and more companies and customers downstream, they are incorporating also um, the cost of CO2 into their sourcing decisions, which is very, very positive, obviously. When we talk about circularity, we are talking a lot about remanufacturing, right. which is super good. Um, we have been awarded also by the Lighthouse from the Water King Forum for circularity. It is totally new business model, and it's also a change of mindset. Believe it, so many people want to have brand new stuff. They don't want to reuse stuff. They want brand new stuff. So it's a change of mindset. But this is not only remanufacturing. It's also in our vision of circularity, it's end to end, meaning it's use better. First, we need to use better. It's transparency, exactly. so it's premium, it's eco-design, it's everything embedded into a product so that at the end of the day, the consumers knows what they are buying. It's trust, transparency, and environmental performance. Exactly. Use better. Then it's used longer how to use longer product, lifetime extension, how to make sure that we don't replace the wall e equipment, but just the part that is deficient. This is repair, maintenance models, etc. This is the second pillar. And then we have the recycling, and for which it is also super critical, because energy transition is consuming lots of raw materials. If right. we want to keep the path of development, we we'll need to reuse the raw material. And that's where it comes, recycling. But I think circularity, it's the whole ecosystem from use better, use longer, use again. Sure. And it's where we can track the momentum. It's not easy because regulation and market is not always ready for it. Yeah. Everybody here is talking about what, what their company is doing and, and how they think they're making a change. But I, I'm wondering, Holger, what, where would you like to see more strategic partnerships? What's missing here that, that could really change the, the, the pace and, and accelerate this journey to net um, zero sustainably while maintaining growth? 
there might be some points I pick one. Yeah? And I would say digital and sustainable need to go hand in hand. And what do I mean? Yeah? There are initiatives like we are driving as industries, Catena X, where we are trying to measure the footprint throughout the value chain. And what would that give us? Yeah? I would have a bottle like this, and I could tell you from the iron ore to the logistics to the glass, what is the carbon footprint of this bottle? And then I could price it. And I could tell you yeah. now you are doing good because you now pay 20 cents more but you are very conscious that you have a green product. Yeah? And this is cross-stakeholder, cross-value chain, mm -hmm. and that's digital. And I think that's something where we can become better. Some of us got started. It's I need to let these guys into my factory yeah, because they can see my data. Yeah, so in former times, it was a no-go. Yeah? How can I let Martin know what the real cost of manufacturing my plant is? Yeah? But this is not the point. Yeah? We partner in a way that he knows exactly what the carbon footprint looks like. I try to do that with my suppliers. And you can take out so many inefficiencies in the supply chain that it becomes a business model again. So short answer, digital, this kind of cross-value chain connection. Martin, do you have a short answer? No, a short answer on that. I, just to build on a very uh, good example for us, I mean, if you look at the whole battery value chain, for example, mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, on the truck side, mm. uh, since trucks are used, passenger cars are not used, they are used 3% of the available time, as you know, so, so the battery will last over the whole life cycle, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a truck, uh, they are ut utilized 80 80 for, uh, percent of, of, uh, of, of the available time, meaning that if you can track that in real time, what has been the behavior, what has been the cyclicality, etc., you can have a very informed decision about, so to speak, what do you do by that when you're taking it out from the truck and utilizing that for a second life and eventually for recycling. Because that is ex extending the life cycle, but it's also to giving a guarantee in, in the, because trust is the ultimate human currency. <laughs> and in order to do that, you need to say, okay, this is what the battery has been all about. Now we can utilize for stationary power or power grid, etc. So that is really how the power of connectivity into IoT then, and into, so to speak, informed facts that you can utilize them even more forceful than with uh, different, uh, different levels of AI to take real-time decisions that will actually extend the life and make, so to speak, the use cases even better for the first customer and the second customer. So digitalization for sure. I think what I want to talk to you about more, um, Gwanael, is the, the Centre for Advanced Manufacturing and Supply Chains and how useful um, it's been um, for, for your business, this Accelerator Initiative. Has it, has it opened your eyes? Has it given you new connections so that you could forge new partnerships? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. So first, what we wanted to do is to be exemplary in our manufacturing footprint. We have today 70 plants that are net zero, and we target to be carbon neutral by 2025, so very short time frame. So it means that we operate today in all our different geographies in digitization, electrification, sustainability, all embedded. When we're doing that for ourselves, it's also a showcase, but you know, throughout the journey, we have ups and downs. It's not easy, as I was mentioning, in terms of technology, business model, cultural shift, in terms of relationship with suppliers, green materials, for example. How to get green materials today? Not that easy, not mature yet. So what I think is the beauty of the initiative is to connect the dots, to share what we are going through, including sometimes it's difficult, but we share that across the board. And therefore, we can be more meaningful. We can step by step make progress. And that's how we would achieve those targets. One example, again, on green material, we have an, object, an objective is to have 50% of green materials embedded in our products by 2025. Not easy, so we need to connect thoughts. We need to have lots of discussion with many suppliers that are shaping the industry of the future in terms of material efficiency, etc. So this is something that is really meaningful in this kind of environment. Brent, yeah, so taking the chance, I want to share about the experience of a lighthouse factory as well. You know, a lot of people think about the advantage of lighthouse factory is going to drive your operation efficiency. Yeah, answer is true, but not only. Actually, we also see the effect in uh, energy management. 
you know, energy management and security management. So because you digitize everything, so you can combine all that together and with the human-centric automation with the AI factory, you know. So because automation investment also huge capex, right? It also involves your, your cost. So you can, with the, new, the Lighthouse Network program, it means you build a showcase. A company like us, we are footprint in 14 countries. Uh, am I going to build every country from zero? No. I better have a showcase. So I can share, I can clone, so I can do tie to market. Investor is going to challenge me if I do everything from zero, right? Yeah. Impossible, especially we are rooting into the emerging countries. They may not have a so mature infrastructure. So the only way is to build a showcase for you to practice. The question I have is regarding the net zero title for this panel, because I heard a lot of good things regarding reducing the needs, regarding being more efficient, more electrified. But then how do you bridge the remaining gap to the so-called net zero? I guess for us now the milestones are very important. Do we reach our milestones? And the further we go, the harder it gets. Yeah? I mean, scope one and two is relatively easy compared to what we discussed with scope three. And scope three has an upstream and a downstream. And we talk now a lot about the upstream, yeah, which is how do we solve, for example, the steel challenge. In my business, steel is... Uh, a very important uh, resource and this will depend now really on do we get the capacity installed to, to have green steel and that's where we act as partners now with the First Mover Alliance and we have CEOs with a commitment to drive this forward. And this is very pragmatic, that's what I love about it. It's not PowerPoint, that's becoming real. Is this a challenge to come to the, the pure zero at the end in 2040? Absolutely. Yeah, eventually, some of us can even go positive in terms of being a net uh, contributor. Yeah? But uh, it becomes always more difficult if you ask me. We need to drive the last mile, which is the most difficult, together. Otherwise, we have no chance. It's like the queue to get through the security block before you get into that, <laughs> isn't it? That last bit of the journey. Martin, how about you, that, that last mile? No, no, but, but, I, but I think, uh, great question. And, and, and I think the whole story was about, I mean, really working through your uh, CO2 footprint for real and understand that huge undertaking, by the way, and start really to, to see where you should go about it. Just to echo what uh, Holger is saying about this, I mean, we need to have... Uh, it's interesting also, I mean, I've been studying together with my team also the eight, 9,000 companies that had actually signed for the science-based organs, including ourselves. What we see is the 2025, not super material targets to, 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 to be frank, I mean, it's minus 15, minus 20 maybe. Uh, 2030 is a milestone that is super interesting because we need to have really changed the curve. And what is good about the science-based targets is that, I mean, you're disclosing it publicly, you're getting it approved, and you need also to disclose progress. And corporates, what is good with corporates, we hate to lose. Uh, so, so, and you hate to see that we are not making progress. And it's not only about the executives, it's also about the colleagues and the teams, and the teams are super excited about it. And then it will be just super hard work to go through vertical by vertical, and it will require innovation, it will require cooperation, it will require new ways of thinking about the partnerships, participating earlier in the understanding of the product design together with our T1s. The T2s, we learned a lot about the semiconductor crisis, how we should actually, we worked a lot <laughs> together. No, we worked a lot together. Yeah. And it was to, to fix the shortage, but we learned also that we need to connect the dots completely different, also for innovation. What nodes are we talking about? So, uh, yeah, there is, no, uh, there is no shortcut at the end of the day. If you have, this is the 100% and it must be 0%. Coming soon on the agenda, the double-edged sword. How to balance the risks and opportunities of artificial intelligence. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in Davos, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>